And this is a very real question. And it's one of the most difficult questions that anyone can ever ask. Why is there so much suffering and evil in the world, but specifically, why do bad things happen to good people? If there is a God, then he must allow that to happen. And if he allows that to happen, then how can he be a good God? So how do we respond to the question of suffering and evil in the world, particularly when we might be the good person to whom these bad things are happening? Now, as you know, we are in a series entitled Redefining Freedom. It's a series taken from the book, the New Testament book of Philippians. Um, the book, or to be more precise, this is a letter that Paul wrote to a church in Philippi. And this letter was written by the Apostle Paul in the middle of a real crisis in his life. Uh, he was in prison, in chains, uh, for his faith. Um, Paul is often considered one of the greatest, if not the greatest, apostle. You are certainly the most influential. His missionary journeys, as most of you would have studied in Sunday school, became famous. He founded church after church, in city after city. And if that wasn't enough, God used him to write most of the New Testament. And what was his reward for all the things that he did? This is what he wrote in another letter to another church. I have been in prison, being flogged been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received the 40 lashes minus one. Let me explain what this means. Within Jewish context, the punishment was so brutal with these 40 lashes that it was possible for somebody to die from it. If you happen to be the person dishing out the punishment, and if you had miscounted the number of lashes, and if you had given 41 and the person died, you'd be accused of murder. And so they took one out to ensure that that would never happen to you. But basically, they would beat you to an inch of your life. Five times I received the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I beaten with rods. And once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open ocean. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen. I've labored and I've toiled and I've gone without sleep. I've known, I've known hunger and thirst and I've often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. And now he's writing to the church in Philippi, imprisoned again and in chains. So did, what did he have to say when bad things happen to good people? And specifically the bad things happening to him. Let's find out. Well, let's look at Paul's attitude towards his situation. Now, one of the reasons why Paul wrote a letter to the Philippians was because they had asked him how he was doing. Um, how was he holding mentally? How was he doing physically and emotionally? Uh, how was he doing spiritually? They loved Paul, and Paul loved this church. And so he was going to talk to them about how he was doing. But before we get into the passage, let me say something that is important for some of you. If you're here this morning and you don't consider yourself a Christian, you've been thinking about it, you've been working through this old faith thing, but you're really not very sure where you stand, you don't quite call yourself a believer, and that's okay, okay? Let me tell you what I'll be sharing with you this morning is not so much an answer to the question of suffering, but more how Paul is addressing suffering in his own life, is writing to believers in how a Christian should respond or can respond when faced with suffering. What we're really listening to is a dialogue between the Apostle Paul and this church in Philippi. So let's look at it. So chapter 1, Philippians, uh, chapter one starting from verse 12. And I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that's happened to me here has happened to spread the good news. For everyone here that sees in prison, including the old palace guards, because I am in chains, they know that I'm in chains because of Christ. 
And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. Let's stop there for a couple of minutes because this is so remarkable. Paul is in prison for his faith in chains in Rome. If you were in, the, in Roman custody, um, there were one or four situations where you find yourself imprisonment with or without chains, military custody, which was being chained to a soldier, released into the custody of a trustworthy person, or then released on your own recognition. Paul here is under military guard, which means that he was chained to a soldier. And the guards selected for being chained to prisoners, history describes them as the worst of the worst. Ignatius, a Christian of the second century, wrote of his own imprisonment and of his situation when he was chained to a soldier. This is what he said, being chained night and day to, it was like being chained night and day to wild beasts who became worse when treated well. That's where Paul finds himself. That's his situation. And what does Paul say about his situation? What's happening to him is good. Why? Because it's helping advance the Christ, the cause of Christ. Firstly, it's good for the palace gods, which really would have numbered thousands. Those who seem in prison know that he's in chains, not because of he has done something wrong, but because of his faith in Christ. And this is kind of making them think about who Christ is. But not only, not only that, it's also challenging Christians who are not in prison, they will be in Rome and those receiving his letters, uh, challenge them not to be afraid, but to be bold and to be outspoken. And so for Paul, in spite of the situation, I bet it is to him it's a wooden situation. Now, if you notice that there isn't a single word about how awful the prison was, how heavy and painful the chains would have been, and they would have been, whether it's cold, lack of food, whether it's been mistreated, nothing of that is said. He wrote nothing to elicit personal sympathy. All he wrote is how people should see that what was happening to him was something that God was using for good. In itself, what was happening to him wasn't good, but God was using it for good. This kind of raises something, <coughs> pardon me, that maybe we don't think about that often. And this is it. Maybe you're asking, why do bad things happen to good people? Maybe the question once in a while should be, what should a good person's attitude be when bad things happen? We all want to rush in and say, bad God, bad God for letting bad things happen to people. But what if it isn't a bad God at all, but a very good God who even when bad things happen, is bringing good out of that. Maybe even a good that outweighs the bad. Paul didn't want to be in jail, but do you think that the jailer who found God through Paul while he was in, while was, he was in jail felt that God should not let Paul be imprisoned, that God was such a bad God? Or did he feel that there was such a good God that he would allow even one of his faithful servants to suffer as he did to reach a man like himself? And you know what? Paul would agree with that. He was actually quite fired up about what was happening to him because he was in chains. He saw people's lives being changed because of what he was going through. That's why these verses are so, so challenging. For most of us, and put me, on, put me on top of the list, for most of us, our default position is it's the same when it comes to pain, to sadness, to the challenges, to difficult moments. Why me? Why is this happening to me? We don't think that maybe some good could come out of the situation, much less that this could affect somebody else positively. Our goal is for people to feel sorry for us, to feel sympathy for, for us, to feel our pain. We want attention. We want to be the victims. In a way, our attitude is, it's all about me. 
Paul's attitude was, it's not all about me. Paul felt that what was happening was more about what God was doing through him than what was happening to him. And because of that, God did precisely that. He used what Paul was going through to impact his jailers. He used it to impact Christians in Rome, in Philippi, and the other churches of the first and second century. He used it to impact people throughout history as part of this book in the Bible, and he's still using it today to impact us today as we read and as we study the letter of Philippians. Some of you are in chains right now. Yes, they may not be physical, but they are just as real. Health problems, relational problems, work problems, family problems, financial problems. And I am not minimizing the seriousness nor the weight of those chains. But here's something that Paul is saying to us. What if what you're going through is not good? Yeah. But could it be that if we allow, God can bring some good out of those bad situations? That's the challenge of Paul in these first few verses of the passage that we read. Can God bring good out of a bad situation? Not only do we find Paul addressing this, but also we see Paul's attitude, not only to his own situation, but towards adversaries. Paul wasn't just having to contend with a very difficult situation in his life. He was having to contend with some difficult people in his life as well. Let's keep on reading the passage. Verse 15. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does that matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this, I rejoice. Here we see another one of Paul's angles, or Paul's attitude towards particularly adversaries. Apparently, there were some people who were not exactly on Paul's side. Um, there were people who had an attitude of competition with Paul, and maybe they saw Paul's time in prison as, as an opening to climb up themselves, to, to gain some control, to make a name for themselves. We don't know the details. All that we know is that we're causing some trouble for Paul. Paul's feelings can be captured in two words in response to this. Who cares? <laughs> now, it's not that Paul didn't think that people's motives were important. They are important. In fact, much of the writings that we find in New Testament address precisely that. What didn't matter to Paul was Paul. Some were promoting Christ while putting him down. Hey, for Paul, that was fine. As long as they were promoting Christ, that's what mattered. It was all about Christ. Now, is that for an attitude check? What was it that really motivated Paul? The name and the honor of God, not his own name, not his own glory. I remember reading somewhere that uh, the American president, Ronald Reagan, at a plaque in his Oval Office had read this. It's amazing how much you can accomplish if you don't care who gets the credit. That's quite amazing, isn't it? And it isn't just the credit. It's having the attitude of being willing to give up what we may consider ourselves to us personally as important so that the kingdom of God can gain. That was Paul's motivation. And so in this chapter so far, we see Paul's attitude to, towards his own situation, Paul's attitude to those who opposed him, and then Paul's attitude towards himself. Let's keep reading. Verse 19. Yes, I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed but I will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, 
whether by life or by death. So what was Paul's attitude towards himself? We've seen that when it comes to his own life, being honored, his attitude is, who cares? But when it comes to whether his life honors Christ, he says, then that's everything. His number one goal was to live in such a way that you would not bring shame to Christ. If I had to paraphrase Paul's entire mindset, his preoccupation with life, it would be something like this. He wanted to finish well. He wanted to run the race well every step of the way. He wanted to finish the line that God had in mind for him without stumbling, without bringing shame to the name of Christ. <laughs> but let's face it, is such an attitude realistic? Paul comes across as such a super saint, living the type of life that is certainly unattainable. I certainly fall very short of that ideal. Let me give you an example. Every morning just about when I drive to work, I am glad I don't have a fish on the back of my car identifying me as a Christian, particularly as I try to get into the traffic. I would have been embarrassed at times, uh, and I certainly would have embarrassed the name of God. So how did Paul do that? Maybe we see that in the text as we continue to look at Paul's attitude towards his life. Verse 21, for me to live is Christ. To die is gain. If I'm going to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet, what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith so that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. As a prisoner in chains for his faith, Paul didn't really know whether he was going to live or die, whether he would be released, whether he would be executed. But he did have one single thought about life on earth, his single attitude that is really life-changing. For Paul, whether it came to life or death, he was in a win-win situation. Live or die, both were fine. Why? Because to live is Christ, to die is gain. To live is Christ, is to be able to be in a relationship with Christ, is to be on mission for Christ, is to have the privilege of having anything to do with the name of Christ on earth, is to be involved in what God is doing in this world. And to die, it's even better. Why? Because to die means more of Christ, full union, full intimacy, free of pain and sin, eternity in heaven, and everything else that heaven has to offer. That's how Paul viewed life. That was his fundamental attitude, to love his Christ, to die is gain. But we don't think that way very often, do we? Death is one thing that we do not see as gain. We hold on to life, we cling to it, and we make death a great evil. Death is a great calamity, great, death is a great loss. Even those of us who follow Christ, we act and we feel that way because it is so final. A writer put it this way, we live as Christians but face death as if we are atheists, fighting and mourning it as if it was the end. But it's not, and Paul knew it. Paul's only struggle was, where do I want to be? And in these verses, he's saying that he hopes to stay, to be alive, not because he feared death, but because the longer he was alive, the more he could serve other believers and the church. Spiritually, it would be better for Paul to remain alive because there was still work that he could do. And that's one of the most challenging teachings that comes from these verses. Because death to self has to be the hardest choice that we make. And when it comes to our own spiritual development and growth and so on, we don't think of ourselves as dying to us for the sake of others. If anything, we want to be given free reign to live 
our own spiritual lives the way that we want, making whatever I want to be paramount to what I want from others. Paul would challenge that view. And let's talk a little bit about it, because often it's not talked about it in churches, but it is crucial teaching that we find in Scripture. A scholar called it spiritual Gnosticism. As we know from Greek mythology, this was the character who, upon seeing his reflection on the water, became so enamored with his image that he devoted the rest of his life to his own reflection. And from there we get the term Gnosticism, which the preoccupation of self. The classic definition would be I, me, myself, and I mentality that places personal fulfillment and pleasure and so on before anything else and everybody else. And sadly, that can affect our spiritual lives as well. Let me give you some examples. Have you ever heard or said any of the following expressions? I want to go to a church where I'm fed. Not where I can learn to feed myself and feed others. I want a church that ministers to me. It's a ministry in life. And the life of a Christ follower is something that happens to us instead of something that we make happen through us for others. I didn't get anything out of the worship today. As if the purpose of worship was about what we get out of it rather than what God gets out of it. Where does that mindset come from? Certainly not from our leader. He didn't talk that way. Remember, he was one who said, I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Where wants to be first must become last. Where wants to be the great amongst you must become a slave of all. Not my will, but your will. And yet, the reality is, as we look at the church in the West today, this spiritual narcissism has penetrated so many of our churches. Why is it that so many churches have as a primary, the, the main, the paramount focus, serving the already saved? The mission of the church becomes taking care of the already saved. Yes, it is true that our mission just about every believer and just about every church will say the same thing. We want to reach the world for Christ. Yet, as you look at our Western world, most don't. Why? Could it be because they have turned inward, not outwardly, focused on the needs of the already convinced instead of the person who has yet to come to faith? And for those of you here this morning who may be exploring what a relationship with Christ really means, you should know this. You discovering and knowing God is far important to us as a church than our own comfort. We want to do everything that we can to help you build a bridge that you can cross to hear, to taste, to explore who Jesus is. And let me say that as long as Matt and I are pastors here, we will do our best to call this church to die to herself for the sake of those who still do not know Jesus. ABC family, this is the call upon our lives. To die to ourselves, our likes and dislikes. It's a call to move towards that which may well take us out of our comfort zones so that we can build bridges that will help others discover and experience Jesus. That's our call. So, how does Paul end this part of the letter? In a way that addresses us. He moves from his life situation to our situations. He says, well, enough about me. Now, let's talk about you. And that's what we're going to do as we look at, we're going to look at over the next six sessions, as we look at the book of Philippians as we do refining, redefining freedom. But for today, there's one thing to consider. What is God the Spirit saying to you this morning? And I'm asking that question because I believe that He is. For some of you, it may well be that God is saying to you, 
I need you to let go of your, it's all about me, I like what suits me mentality for the sake of those that need to come to faith. For some of you, it's finding the strength to cope with your chains, whatever they may be, until God delivers you from your situation. And maybe just take that immense step of faith to allow the bad that's happening to you to bring some good in the hands of God. Whether the need is for you to die to your own preferences for the sake of those needing Jesus Christ, or the need for strength to cope with your present situation, it's a need to see the power of the Spirit of God at work in your life. In a few moments, we're going to close with our last song. Here's some other words we're going to sing. When all foundations have been shaken, when I'm left standing in the dark, and all I feel is my heart breaking, you still reign. You still God. And when it feels all hope has faded and heavy questions hit so hard, and though my soul may feel forsaken, you still reign, and you are still God. This morning, I'm going to invite you to sing this song to the audience of just one. Forget the team up here. Forget those around you. Whether you're singing tune or not, forget that. Forget everyone and everybody sitting around you and focus on the one that you're singing to. The one who can help you share your struggles, your challenges, your doubts. Ask him to fill you with the power of the Spirit so that you may know how to cope with the situations that you have faced today. Let's pray. Father, thank you that as we look at the story of Paul, we see some really, really challenging instructions for us. And probably the most difficult is to take the focus out of ourselves and to place them upon you, upon your name, Lord. My prayer for myself and for each one of us here this morning is that you'd help us to see just what a difference that makes. And yes, none of us likes to go through difficult things, Lord. And I pray that you keep us safe from them. That help us to go through those moments of challenge with the hope that you know what you are doing, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.